Well, hey everybody, happy Sunday to you. Happy uh, food truck Sunday to you. Happy costume Sunday to you. Happy costume food truck final Sunday of October to you. I'm really, really glad that you're here today. You know, we sometimes have this expectation in life. It, it kind of goes unspoken, but it's there nonetheless, where we think, like, if I belong to God, you know, if I'm a Christian, if I sort of toe the line and do my part, you know, in this spiritual church Jesus thing, then I should get a pass on the difficulties of life. Like, other, other folks may have to face difficulties and problems and storms and trials and all that kind of thing. And I'll certainly help them out, like, through all that. But in my own life, it shouldn't be that way, you know? We think to follow Jesus is supposed to be a storm-free life. But that expectation kind of crashes quickly on the rocks of reality, doesn't it? You know, the truth of the matter is that life comes with storms. It simply does. In fact, Jesus clearly states in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. Storms will come to you and me. They even came to Jesus' first disciples, his earliest disciples. Literally, storms came to them. If you have a Bible, I'd like for you to get to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And what we see here in Matthew, this episode we're going to look at, it comes right after a miracle that Jesus performs. He, he's surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. He and his disciples, they've been serving them all day. He'd been healing all kinds of people who were sick. And then they get hungry, and they don't have anything to eat, and he does a miraculous feeding of thousands of people with practically nothing, five loaves and two fish. Two fish. And at the end of that day, that full day where Jesus and his disciples had served this multitude of people, here's what we read in verse 22 of chapter 14 of Matthew. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Later that night, the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So the disciples of Jesus, they find themselves in this storm. You know, sometimes we create our own storms, you know. We drink too much. We borrow too much. We hang out with the wrong crowd. We find ourselves in a storm of our own making. But this wasn't the case with the disciples, you know. They were in this storm because Jesus told them to be there. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. See, this wasn't like uh, Jonah. Some of you know the story of Jonah. This wasn't like the prophet Jonah trying to escape God. These were disciples looking to obey Jesus. And yet they're in a storm. You know, these are like the missionaries who move overseas only to have their support evaporate. These are the business leaders who take the high road only to be outbid by some dishonest competitor. This is the student who studies really, really hard only to still come up short on the exam. You know, these are the parents who've, you know, given and given and given to their kid. They've been there for their kid. But still, in the end, there's this gap, and the kid is just a long way from home, you know. These are good people trying to do the right thing, but it doesn't work out. These are disciples who launch a boat as Jesus instructed, only to sail head first into a furious storm. See, storms come to the obedient. Don't miss that. Storms come to to the obedient. And they come with a punch too. You know, verse 24 says the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Storms on the Sea of Galilee, uh, they could come up in a hurry. They could be very, very fierce. The cool air surrounding the mountains would mix with the warm air near the water. And the result would, would just be a furious, furious storm. And Jesus said, told the disciples to get into the boat in the evening, all right? And evening became night, night became windy and rainy, and before long their boat was just riding this sort of raging roller coaster of a storm on the Sea of Galilee there. 
And this was supposed to be a five-mile trip across the Sea of Galilee. It should have taken them about an hour, but it's the fourth watch now when this is going on, which is about three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And the disciples, they're still a long, long way from shore because the storm's raging, the wind is directly against them. And listen, they deserve some credit too, right? They didn't turn around. They didn't go back to the shore. They persisted in obedience to Jesus. They kept digging the oars in the water, trying to pull the boat across the sea, but it was just a losing battle. And they found themselves in the middle of this storm where they had been for hours and hours a long way from the shore. Now put yourself in their shoes for just a second. They had to be exhausted. I'm sure they were scared. They might have even been a bit ticked off. Like, we got to think they were wondering, like, hey, where's Jesus, you know? And the Bible doesn't tell us they asked that question aloud, but you can be sure, be assured, they were wondering it. Where in the world is Jesus right now? You ever asked that before? Like, where are you right now, God? What are you doing? Can't you see what's going on in my life? We ask that question all the time. Where are you? Where are you, Lord? Where are you, God? When the storms hit our lives, we ask, where in the world is Jesus? Do you know where Jesus was when the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the storm? It's actually pretty clear uh, here in, in Matthew, and it's probably a bit surprising. Jesus was praying. The 23rd verse says Jesus had gone up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And there is no indication that he did anything else. He didn't eat. He didn't sleep. He didn't get a little cardio in. He didn't catch up on the chosen. He prayed. He prayed. After he served all day, He prayed all night. He too, Jesus too, you understand, was in the storm, but still he prayed. Or maybe we should say it this way. He was in the storm, so he prayed. During storms, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 34, that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This is our word of the day, interceding, intercession. We've been in this series. We're actually wrapping up this series today on this final Sunday of October. It's the final week of this series called The Letter I. We've been looking at these different concepts or ideas or doctrines or practices that we really got to intertwine into our lives. We've got to get them deep in our lives in order to move toward maturity in Christ Jesus. And each of these concepts we've been talking about throughout this series, they just happen to start with the letter I. And today's word is interceding. And, and this word here, in this verse here in Romans 8, 34, interceding, it's actually, it's translated as a very stout verb. It, and it carries the sense of making this specific request or petition before someone else, where you go on behalf of someone else in order to plead their case. Biblically speaking, somebody who intercedes, someone who is an intercessory, or an intercessor, they bring this sort of passionate and specific requests before God. So think about this. Jesus, according to the Bible, right now, at this moment, in the midst of whatever it is that's going on in your life, if it happens to be a storm or a problem or, you know, whatever it is that you face, Jesus is interceding for you. The king of the universe is speaking on your behalf. He's he's calling out to the heavenly father. He's urging the help of the Holy Spirit. He is advocating for a special blessing or or strength or relief or, or provision to be sent your way. You do not fight whatever it is you fight. You do not fight the wind and the waves alone. In some ways, it's not even up to you to find a solution. You have the holiest advocate standing up for you. 
There's actually this instance in the Bible, in the book of Acts, when Stephen, some of you know about Stephen, he was uh, martyred. He was the very first Christian martyr, and he was martyred for his faith. And in Acts 7, it says that Stephen gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. You see, Jesus stood up for Stephen. You ever had anybody stand up for you? You know, when I was in the seventh grade, I started in on my first year at Vance Junior High School. Vance Junior High School was two grades, seventh grade and eighth grade. And when I was a seventh grader, at the very beginning of the school year, the very first week of the year, I ended up having somebody who picked on me a little bit. I had a sort of bully in the seventh grade, and his name was Charles. And Charles had been around Vance Junior High for quite a while. <laughs> like he was a seventh grader, but he was shaving and working on his learner's permit, you know? <laughs> and Charles, even though he struggled in uh, English and math, he got an A in intimidation. Like he was a master of intimidation. And here's how it worked, okay? We would be dropped off at the front entrance to Vance Junior High School, that was the only door that was open, you were allowed to go in, and you could go in into the halls, but you couldn't go in to the classrooms until the bell rang. Once the bell rang, you could go on into your class. Well, I was in the band, and I played trumpet, and what all of us band kids would do is we would take our instrument that we had taken home and practiced so diligently on the night before, and we would walk through the halls, and the band room was in the very back of the building. So we'd walk through the front door, make our way, wiggle our way through the hallways where everybody was standing, and we would drop off our instrument. At, we'd just slip it right inside the band room door. And then band was the last class uh, and session of, of the school day, and uh, that's where we would end up in our day. And I would walk through the hall as a little seventh grader, and there was Charles. Again, Charles. Got, you know, five o'clock shadow at seven in the morning. <laughs> and he saw that I was in the band and he just would berate me. I don't actually remember him like laying his hands on me, but he would like stand in, in between where I was trying to go. And he would just say like, what are you kidding me? Look at you. You're so weak and feeble and, you know, whatever he would say. You know, I was like... I was like a wildebeest on the plains of Vance Junior High, getting ready to cross over the Hallway River where the apex predator Charles the Alligator was waiting to devour me, okay? <laughs> that was what was going on. Now, I also happened to be a football player. Yep. I was a linebacker, Yeah, <laughs> I was. You can believe that. And on football game days, they allowed us to wear our football jerseys. That was usually on Thursdays. And so there I was. The first game of the year, had my Vance Junior High blue and white jersey on. I got my trumpet. I was dropped off the front of the school, and I'm making my way through the hallways. You know, and At one point, my mom, I told my mom about this, and she said to me, she said, well, do you want me to walk you through the hall? And I was like, no. <laughs> do you want to ruin my life? My high school reunion, they used to have a high school reunion last weekend, 35 years of high school graduation. I would forever be known as, there's David, the kid whose mom walked him to the back of the class. <laughs> like, no, I don't want you to walk me through the high school. But here I was, wearing my jersey, carrying my trumpet, and there's Charles. And he just got the biggest kick out of this, man. He starts, he starts fussing at me. He's, he's like, are you kidding me? They let you be on the football team you of all people, no way. What is this world coming to? That kind of thing. And then in stepped another linebacker. His name was Ricky. Ricky, too, had been around Vance Junior High for a while. He was on like the, <laughs> the three-year plan, you know. <laughs> Charles was on the five-year plan. Ricky was on the three-year plan, so he was eligible, you know. And we happened to play the same position, linebacker, you know. He was the Mike, for sure. I was the weak side linebacker, no doubt. But Ricky had big old curly hair. He was red-haired. Ricky, he comes in there, and he sees what's going on. And so he steps in. He's got his jersey on, too, and he just said one little line. He said, hey, to Charles, he's okay. And that was it. Charles never picked on me again. He went back to, 
I don't know, picking locks or <laughs> selling speakers out of his back of his van or <laughs> kicking puppies, whatever it was that Charles did all those years at Vance. I had an advocate. I had an intercessor, someone who stepped in on behalf of me. You ever had somebody step in for you? The answer is yes, actually. You know, for Jesus' disciples, for anybody who's been invited in and welcomed into God's family through Jesus Christ, he is standing at this very moment offering intercession on your behalf. Like, give Mary the strength to face this interview, you know? Give Tom wisdom necessary to be a good dad. Help Chad do well on the test. Keep Natalie safe. Defeat the evil one who's looking to rob Ashley of peace. Where is Jesus? Peter and the other disciples must have asked. Where is Jesus? The overstressed, the isolated, the bedridden, the discouraged, the hurting ask all the time. Where is he? He's in the presence of God the Father, praying for us, interceding for us. He says to us what he said to Peter this instance, knowing there's this one particular occasion where Peter knew, you know, he was about to go through just perhaps the toughest storm he'd ever faced. He was about to be severely, severely tested by Satan. And Jesus said to him, assured him, he said, Peter, Satan has looked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus prayed for Peter. He stood up for Stephen, and he promises to pray and stand up for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. When we forget to pray, he remembers to pray. When we're full of doubt, he's full of faith. When we're unworthy to be heard, he is ever worthy to be heard. Jesus is the sinless and perfect high priest interceding for us. When he speaks, all of heaven listens, you see. And this should give us a great deal of hope. I mean, we'd like to know the future, you know, how everything's going to work out, but we don't. And we'd like to see the road ahead of us for our lives, but, you know, we can't. We'd like every question answered, but they won't be. Jesus has instead chosen to let us in on this much, all right? He says, I will pray for you through the storm. And are the prayers of Jesus answered? Do you think they're answered? Well, of course they are. Will you make it through your storm? I think you will. And, and we may actually object. We may say, you know, if Jesus is praying, why does the storm come in it at all? Why does the storm happen at all? Wouldn't an interceding Jesus guarantee a storm-free life? And the answer, of course, is a storm-free life will come eventually. One day it will be inaugurated in the eternal kingdom of God. But between now and that inauguration, since this is a fallen, sin-tainted world, and since the evil one still stirs up doubt and fear, well, we can count on storms coming our way. But we can also count on the presence and prayers of Jesus in the middle of it all. He always lives to intercede for us. For his followers, Jesus is praying. In the midst of your storm, in the midst of your problem, he's praying for you. And through the midst of your storm, he's actually coming. I think what all this means is, you and I can rest. You and I, we get so uptight and anxious and filled with fear and doubt. And what it means to have Jesus interceding on our behalf is that we can just kind of set all that down. We can set all that anxiety and wringing of our hands and just set it down because we have one interceding for us. And not just anyone, but the one, the Prince of Heaven, the Son of the Most High God, the one who defeated hell and death and who is right now talking to God about you and me and anybody who is found in him, you see. And no matter what your storm is, you understand he's coming for you. 
Matthew, back to Matthew 14, verse 25 says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. You see, Jesus, he actually became the answer to his own prayer right here for his disciples. He turned this uh, water into a walkway, like the one who made the Red Sea become two walls for Moses, and the one who made the iron axe head swim for Elisha. He transformed the water of Galilee into a level path and became, you know, his own answer. He came walking right there to the apostles in the storm, and they panicked. They never expected to see Jesus in that, that furious storm on the sea, but he came for his disciples. And he'll come for you too, whatever your storm is, whatever storm you find yourself in. He'll do for you what he did for those first disciples. His followers called him a ghost, but still he came. Peter's faith became fear, but Jesus still walked across the water. The winds, they continued to howl and, and rage, but Jesus wasn't distracted at all. He stayed the course until his point was made, that he is sovereign over every storm. And as a result, what happened is the disciples, for the very first time in the Bible, the disciples, they worshiped Jesus. Truly, you are the Son of God, they said. With the water finally calm, their hearts racing there, they worshiped him. And I think we should do the same. And here's how we're going to worship him. You understand, Jesus gave his life to overcome all the storms. The ones we create for ourselves, the ones that find us, that come to us. Whatever storm you happen to find yourself in, whatever problem you happen to face, you understand that Jesus overcame it all by giving up his life on the cross. And we're going to commemorate that. We're going to focus on that and think about that. When Jesus took his body and gave it for us, he spilled his blood on the cross for us. He defeated, ultimately, he defeated the storm. He will usher in that eternal world where there is no storm. And we celebrate that. We focus on that. We cling to that. And we're going to do that right now. Uh, we do that by taking this little piece of bread, this little cup of juice. It reminds us of Jesus' body and his blood that was given for us. And if you didn't get one of these, you can make your way to the back back there. And let's take a few moments right now. Let's focus on Jesus, the one who calms the storm, the one who is interceding for us, the one who is praying for us, the one who interceded before the Father for you and me. See? And then we'll sing one final song. You need me? Oh. Oh.